Hallelujah. Well, I don't know how you follow that. I had some, I thought I was, what I was going to do and then I want to follow that. So thank you so much. As, um, one of the things that, that, we, that I live by, Diane and I both do, is that years, a few years ago, the Lord spoke to me and says, the father of the house always lays up for the children. The children do not lay up for the fathers. And so we're all about laying something up for the next generation, what God's doing, and after that. So with, without a whole lot of expectation, uh, we're always su- pleasantly surprised when, when things you know, come our way in that way. So I'm very thankful, and we appreciate your generosity and your heart for, for what... Uh, for that. Um, glad to be home. And uh, Diane asked you, why don't you share a couple of things that happened when we were there? Um, and it was just a, a week full of just ministered about eight times in a, in a short period of time of there because it takes three days traveling, going and coming. Uh, three days going, three days and coming back to really because you lose time with that. But on the way there, I was in the plane and, and uh, it wasn't a, an airline that I had any perks with. And so I said, Lord, I know that, I'm, that by nature, there's not anything I'm going to get out of this, but I have 23 hours uh, in the air. And then as soon as I get there, we start ministering. And so I would really be so happy if you could get me something beyond where I'm at and didn't have a bad seat. And so, but nonetheless, I'm going to be happy with whatever you give me. And I know that you'll take care of me. And so I uh, had an aisle seat there, which was always a good thing. I was in the big Airbus, the double-decker, and I was upstairs, and, and uh, about 400 people. And the flight attendant came to me. It was a man, and he said, Sir, I have four seats down by the galley next to the restroom that no one is sitting in. Don't know why. But no one is there. And so if you'd like for me, I'll move your things down to there, and you can pull up the armrest, and you can sleep there all night, and I'll make sure nobody bothers you. And I thought, this is better than first class. Because first class, you can't fully, you know, get out that way. And I said, yes, I'll take it. And I was just drifting off and the Lord saying, but if you'll honor me with your substance and honor with me who you are, I'll take care of you because I'm sending you. And so when we got there, there was some tremendous things. There was, um, uh, we've been in drug rehab centers and churches out on the streets, wherever, you know, that uh, the day would take us. And I was in one church in a, in a, uh, well, we, one evening we were in a place called Without Walls. It was a church. And, uh, but it was on a Friday night, which is an outreach to anybody in the community. Place is packed out, close to 500 people there. And uh, after I finished preaching, I walked back to a girl. There I say girl, she's probably 40, which they're pretty girlish, it's still at 40. And uh, the word over her was the fact that, that uh, God is, is striking from you a judgment that was set against you. And I heard the gavel come down and say, all is forgiven. Fell to the ground, began to cry, just repenting to the Lord and going on the Lord. And found out later she was on Crime Stoppers the night before wanted for armed robbery. <laughs> She gave her heart to the Lord, repented, just got clean with God, and because one of the guys there says, "Hey, I know who she is," and uh, and so the, the law has been looking for her. So I don't know how all that's going to work out, but nonetheless, she came to the Lord. Another interesting healing was, uh, in a, it was in a Baptist church in another city, and um, a lady was healed that had been had not been able to sleep for over twelve years had not had a full night's sleep in 12 years. She was just tormented, driven. And it wasn't sleep apnea, it was a tormenting spirit. So through the word of knowledge about this tormenting spirit that had come to her in her dreams and in her mind at night and torment her about her children, and that was the word over her, he expressly said that. And then uh, God set her free. So the next day, because there was a conference, morning and night meetings, the husband came to me the next morning and said, I've got to tell you that my wife slept all night without getting up, moving around, thrashing around, and she woke up this morning feeling refreshed. We had no idea it was a demonic thing. And so continually setting people free. Meth is a huge problem there in, uh, in the Western Australia. It's just everywhere, all of that. And so we saw drug addicts set free, people come to the Lord, and it's just a continual fulfilling of all of that going on. So... Anyway, and as soon as I got there first night, I got laryngitis and had seven meetings after laryngitis. 
and uh, my voice sounds pretty strong I compared to what it was. I'd have just enough voice to do the meeting and then praying for people out the door down to a whisper. And uh, some people I couldn't even pray for didn't have voice to just lay hands on them and just in my, my, in my heart, mine were praying over them and, and got free with that. So having laryngitis to a speaker at a conference is like a beauty queen getting a zit on the first day, you know, the prom. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, this, this morning to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Good yeah, thank you. It's all vanity and vexation anyway, right? I want to th- continue on and finish up uh, this week with in part four of uh, releasing power through authority. And just want a quick review because uh, it's one of the most important things that I have, I think, for a believer to understand how the two walk together and how they function together. Uh, at one of the, the guys, the pastors there who I've known for a number of years, I've, I think this was my eighth trip over there, and I don't make a lot of it because it's, you know, it's 23 hours in the, in the air. And he said to me, uh, taking me to the airport, he said, there's something different about you this time. What is it? And I said, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And he said, no, there's something different. Sawing things happening. We've always seen good things happening and joy, some of those, but there was something different happened. So I started going through this message with him a little bit and talking to him. He's a young guy and growing in this ministry. And uh, so I talked to him about sometimes, and I've seen this with him, and I've earned the right. I said, you something that as of a nature, you're not giving it off second-handedly. You're not giving off what someone said. You have experienced it for yourself. So many times in church life, we sit and we hear people talk about something but have never encountered what they're talking about. And unless you've encountered it, you don't have the right to do it and walk in it. I believe that Jesus can because I've heard the story. But once you have encountered Jesus, then you're doing what he said you could do. You're walking in the full authority that you said you could do. And there's a big distinction there. So let's pick it up, Matthew, the seventh chapter, and being in verse uh, 28. Um, and they begin to say this about Jesus. After Jesus had ended these things that he was talking, giving the, the parable of the bill on the, the rock, the house on the rock in the sand. And it was so when Jesus had ended these sayings, these parables, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority. Now, this is Matthew writing this. He, is t- he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. They made the distinction between what they were used to as scribes and the Pharisees, but the scribes particularly. The scribes were those who were philosophers who were known to quote other philosophical teachers. And they would... Uh, they would quote the, the philosophers of their day and they would quote what other rabbis had had said and written out of the mitzvah, which was nothing more than a rabbinical commentary, what they said, the, 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 the 500 and some odd laws that Moses, uh, that they had taken out of context from Moses. And they were quoting other writers and other scholars how many times do you hear now in ministry in places where you hear people quoting a poem or quoting what somebody else has written? And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just simply, I'm just reporting by what somebody else said. But when you have witnessed and experienced something firsthand and you've had an encounter by the power of the Lord and the love of God has so constrained you and touched you deeply in your heart, it's no longer you telling what somebody else said. Now you're speaking firsthandedly. Jesus was teaching them as one having authority or authorship. And authorship is something that you initiate, that there's an initiation inside of you. One having authority, they're not waiting on somebody else to prompt them. They're not waiting on someone else to volunteer them. They're not waiting for someone else to shove them out in the water. There's an authority, there's an authorship inside of them that stands up on the inside of them and says, somebody ought to do something. And they make the response instead of setting back
heard a voice just screaming the top of their tongue, their voice behind me. And Daddy, I don't know where I'm at. Please help me, Daddy. I'm scared. Help me. I need someone. Else. And just out of panic, out of control. I watched people look at her and they were pointing at this girl. She's probably in her early 20s, pointing at her, kind of mocking her like, how can you get this way and so on like that. There was about 20 people standing at the desk. Not even an agent would walk, do anything with her. And I heard the Lord say to me, she has a father in heaven and now I'm telling you, go take care of her. And I thought, well, Lord, what if she thinks I'm a kook or crazy and said, go take care of her. In other words, I'm not into debating. I'm not a scribe that you can just quote a story and then just move on from there. You've got to take action on this issue. And I walked on and tapped her on. She said, what? And I said, I'll help you get where you need to go. And daddy, someone's here help me. He said, I'll call you back later. She had canceled her flight. They moved her to another airline. Her ticket didn't even stay with you until you get that place. She's reached out and hugged me. And the Lord spoke to me and he's saying, there are a lot of people that carry authority, but very few people step out in the authority because they're happier with having the idea of authority and a title of authority, but never use the authority. And until the authority is used, there's no power released. And when authority is stepped out on and acted on, there's a power beginning to happen that way. It's like seeing somebody, what, somebody ought to go pray for that person. Well, they can have the authority as a believer to go pray for them, but the power of God is not transferred and released through them until they make a step towards that person and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. We find on the day of Pentecost in Acts 3, where Peter, James, and John, after they had been empowered by the Holy Spirit, they're walking up the temple. They're, they're at the gate, beautiful. And the word beautiful is the word hariza, translated means the gate of right timing. We get the word kairos from that. And they see this beggar who they had seen so many other times before and probably had given money to them. But something different happened this time because as they saw him, he said, Peter said to them, look at me. Silver and gold I don't have, which has been the norm that I would have done for you. But such as I have, I give unto you. They had just been empowered by the promise of the Father. And now it was up to them whether they were going to step into that or they were just going to simply give testimony like I was there on the day of Pentecost. Look what happened to me. I can speak in tongues. Hallelujah. You want to hear me speak in tongues? And I'm all thankful for that. But for the purpose of that authority was not for to have a title search, but the idea was to step into it. As the Father has sent me, so I have sent this. Silver and gold have I named. They took him by the hand and pulled him up at that point. There is a boldness when authority is there that causes a person to act, not just react. It causes them to step out by the power of the Holy Spirit with an understanding that God has sent me to set the captives free. He has sent me to accomplish the purpose of God. Jesus said, greater things than, than these that you've been seeing will I you do because I go to my Father and I'm sending one greater not, he'll not only be with you, but he shall be in you. So by that token, he'll be in you because he is no longer on the outside giving you, letting you see, but is now inside of you working through you. The idea of authority is the uh, author, uh, authorship that originated. So he has given us something that originated with him that Jesus operated in, that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of every one of us. Most Christians today would say, I know the teaching on the authority of the believer. And when you find out what they do, you find out it simply is a position that they believe in, but very few step into, very few act in. We're in a time, folks, where we can complain about Caesar, the government. We can complain about all this stuff until by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, whatsoever you bound on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you allow on earth has already been allowed in heaven. How you stand in that authority depends whether you complain about it or you bind it. Right. How you deal with it is the authority or we simply report about somebody should do something. And God has brought his government to the earth according to Isaiah the ninth chapter. says a son is given us, a child is born, and unto us the government 
is given, and upon his shoulders of this government there shall be no end. He has put this government of heaven inside of every one of us. And we should govern by the authority of heaven, govern by the power of the Holy Spirit, govern under the unction of the Holy Spirit, instead of looking to someone else or something out of Washington, D.C. to govern us. We are not under the kingdom of earth. We're under the kingdom of heaven. We are aliens passing through this earth. We're, our, our, our life is not here. I have an address where I get my, L, my mail, but my heart is in another address. And that is the kingdom of God is now among men. And the kingdom of God has come to us, and it's come to us through the authority of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. And so when I don't use that authority, what I'm saying is, I'm glad you gave it, Jesus, but I'm not going to use it. It's like having a gift at Christmas and you think, what is it? I'm not going to use that thing. We've had the greatest gift given unto us. Unto us a son is given, and he gave to us the promise of the Father, which was the, the part of the, the administrating the estate of heaven and saying, now, here it is. Walk in it. Do it. What you do with it is up to you. We can teach on it but it's something else to start into. Most of the time, God puts me in situations that I have no other choice. Because if I knew that if I had choices, then I probably would not choose that choice. I've been put in situations where the devil just basically just stares up in the face and thumbs his nose at you and said, what are you going to do about this, boy? Ah. I'm just going to say, it is written. It is written. It is written. And God sent me to cast you out here. That's why he's already cast you out there. And because you've been cast out there, I have the right to cast you out here. So therefore, get out of my way. I'm sent by the authority of the Holy Spirit. That's the way that I felt the last two times in Australia primarily, dealing with drug addicts and trying to get in their mind and their head that these cravings and all of this, and we've seen more results by speaking to that thing that has lied to them and said you can't get free except where you are. Yeah. Many of them are angry at God because God didn't deliver them because God didn't take it on, and yet they want no responsibility for what their actions have been. They want no responsibility for what they need to do. They're looking for someone to set them free. And the compassion of the Lord, they do come set them free, but then they have to walk out of that. They, Jesus taught them as one, not who's reporting, but one who stepped into that. The first time that, that they saw God move in a powerful way coming to the Hebrews was the plagues there in Egypt, and God delivered them. Moses comes up to the, up to, uh, the Red Sea, you know the story there, and the only time that I find in Scripture where God tells someone to quit praying... He comes up to the Red Sea, and the armies of the Egyptians are coming after him. They, they decided to change their mind. They're coming back after the, after the slaves. And God, he, Moses starts crying out to God, and God says to Moses, basically, why are you crying out to me? Take them over. In other words, I have already given you the authority and the right to cross over, but you're looking to me to do it. If I've given you the authority, don't ask me to do it for you. If you have the authority to do something, then do it. So many times that's what happens. He's given us authority and we say, Lord, you come down and do it. Thy, my word is nigh you in your mouth. You have the authority to be able to do it. I'm not going to come down and do it. I said it was finished. And finished means I've transferred the deed of title to the authority over to you now. If you turn around and give it away to the devil, then that's up to you. But you have the authority on what you're going to do with it, the authority you have in your life, the authority you have over things that affect your family. Every time that a person steps into sin, I've taken my authority and I said, I've yielded the devil here. I'm checking my authority at the door. But every time that you resist it and say, devil, that's not, that's, you're going to do better than that. I'm not going that way. Then you've taken your authority and you've held it as holy and saying, this is my right, my righteousness in Christ. And I stand by his authority and I say, you don't have the right to even come near me. I haven't got out of the previews yet. <laughs> Jesus said in John, the 10th chapter, right after he was teaching them, he gathered them. Uh, Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 1. He gathered the 12 together, and the Bible says, and he gave them. It was a gift. And he gave them authority over all of the unclean spirits and power. The word authority, exousia, and the word power, dynamis, they interchangeable. Sometimes in verses, they'll use the same word as authority. You have to find out what it means. 
but authority is the right to act and the power is the release of the dynamic of God pre- God's presence on that situation. But a lot of times power is not released because a person doesn't step in with authority to be able to do that. Authority is the right to act. Power is the action to the right to act on that. He called them together, gave them authority over all the unclean spirits to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and proclaim the coming of the Lord. Now, all authority in Proverbs 4, the Bible says that out of the heart, the innermost being, is the issues of life. Authority that's given to us by God through Jesus Christ And the power, the level of that authority operates, comes out of the heart. When the heart is not committed, submitted, and and remitted to God, then what happens is that heart is what the Bible calls double-minded. And James says a double-minded is a two-head, schiza, schizophrenic, we get the word there. A double-minded person will in no wise uh, find answers to what God's saying. He will not be able to see answered prayer to that. A double-minded person is one, I believe in God, but I've got one foot still over on this side too. The word commit means I have given, I've given admittance to all of myself, completely committed, and so I'm there, body, soul, and spirit. A commitment to Jesus Christ just doesn't mean on a Sunday. It means a com- complete fulfillment of all God wants. I'm fully in God. Both hands on the plow, not looking back, not changing my mind, not altering to another plan. I am giving myself completely to you. When that happens, there comes a level of of a sense of boldness to the authority that's already given. When a heart is not committed, then yeah, I know the Bible says that I have authority and all that, but I just don't see it really doing that much. I I don't have confidence. When I say, get behind me, devil, he keeps coming. You know why? It's because he understands the heart. The issues of life flow out of the heart. I also find Peter says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge so that your prayers are not hindered. The enemy knows whether if you've got a divided house, a divided heart, a divided mind, whatever is divided, and that authority that's divided. Because the Bible says when he sees, he sees the two in covenant, he sees one, he doesn't see two. When a life is walking in covenant with God, there is a level of authority that says that you have, you're bounded together, and you have the right with the authority to say, get behind me, Satan. He'll move, go from that point. So having, when is authority blocked in our life is that when our relationship with Jesus is not fully committed. I met people when I, all around from every kind of angles where they were atheists. They believed that there was a, a sort of, some sort of divine power there. One girl she was high on, uh, she just come, she ran from the, the rehab, came back. She was coming down, but she was still pretty high. And I was going to the, uh, getting ready to leave to our next meeting. And, and uh, the director said, will you pray for her? And I looked at her and I said, in the name of Jesus, she said, quit cursing me. And I said, do you believe in God? She said, I believe there's a higher power. And I says, I'm going to pray to the highest of all power." Because your mind can't receive it, but I'm going to speak into your spirit. And I started praying over her, binding that spirit, not only of addiction, but of lies that have lied to her that this is who you are, an identity to her. And she just got so weak, she had to go sit down because of just being overwhelmed by the spirit of God. Her mind couldn't receive it, but her spirit was hearing it. When there is this understanding that an expect, expectation that when we say in the name of Jesus, everything that that name was meant and said in heaven and earth, that every knee should bow in heaven and earth because of that name of Jesus. When you say in that name of Jesus and you've had an encounter with that name of Jesus, what happens is that name destroys the works of the devil. For this very purpose, the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, many times we pray in Jesus' name, hoping well, when you had an encounter with him, you say in the name of Jesus with not just hoping or wishing, but with an expectation that it will manifest in the way that his name was sent. And he sent himself. He sent his word. He is the word. And it healed them and delivered them out of that completely. Now, look with me at Matthew 13 chapter. And I want to look at the idea as to when authority is blocked. You know, you, growing up in home, you and you see the, how the authority structures are in home. You know, dad has authority, mom has authority. And, and I, when I was growing up at home, that, um, 
when we wanted something, we went to my mom. And when I needed something, you know, heavy duty, hard to lift, I went to my dad. And so we just knew how the authority structure worked out. But we also learned how to work one against the other. Well, went to my dad and said, Mom said, she hadn't yet, but I knew that she would. So based on knowing her, I said, Mom said, if it's okay with you. He said, well, if it's okay with Mom. So I'd go to Mom. Mom said, Dad said, if it's okay with you, then that. And she said, well, if your dad said so, then that's it. Well, Mom said, if that's it. So we went back and forth. And so the authority was, was pretty divided in that way. What happens when that authority is blocked when we two shall, when we, how can any two walk together unless they're agreed? The word agree there is the word homologeo, which means to say the same thing, speaking on the same, the same level, the same tenor with that. So the idea with that is that when authority can be blocked, though we have authority and we see it blocked and we don't see a breakthrough, then we need to understand what is blocking that authority. A few weeks ago, I was, uh, well, a few months ago, I talked about the courts of heaven. There are times when we're blocked in, in heaven because of accusation, according to what Daniel 7 talks about. When there's things that happen that the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, has brought up to God and we have not dealt with it. Because God is truth by his own word. God is held to his word. Just in the same way that a good, a good city or nation has a code, they have, they have laws, and when you go before that judge, you have to state, the law says, here's my rights to that law. And so we find out, remember I was sharing this related to the church as well, that there are sometimes the enemy brings accusation against a family and individual that never was dealt with. It could be through a family generational thing. It could be to where we see people blaming God or accusing God and, or God you never, God you haven't. And so they're blocked in heaven and so thus they're, they're blocked in heaven, they're blocked on earth. And you find there in, in Daniel 7 where they come before, before the courts of heaven and the accuser of the brethren is stating issues that have fact to them. Lord, you can't bless them because your word says, and this has been a bloodline of family, one particular dealing with their family, uh, was the fact there was a promiscuousness. There was the adultery through the family on and on and on again. Well, they didn't realize that other members, the father and the grandfather and all of them had had adultery running through the family, and yet it was happening with them. There was a bloodline thing happening, and so they just accepted it well. We messed up, made a mistake. Instead of realizing that in the courts of heaven, the, the devil's up there telling, accusing, saying, Lord, you said that this adultery is, is a, an assault against you. Therefore, how can you bless that family? They were blocked. They would do everything that everybody was teaching on authority, everything that people brought about. And God, you're blessing other people. You're not blessing me. And thus they became angry at God. God, you show favoritism. No, he doesn't but he does show truth to his word. My word, thy word have I hid in my heart so that I would not sin against you, O God. So with that, the authority is blocked. So we go into heaven, we, the Holy Spirit says, here's the accusation. He's like the, the, the devil is a prosecutor. The Holy Spirit is our advocate or judge and says, you just need to fall on the mercy of the court and you just need to ask Jesus to forgive you. When that happens, you see in Daniel 7, the, the judge of the universe comes and he rules in favor of the saints because the blood of Jesus over trumps the accusation when sin is dealt with. When it is excused and saying, well, you know, everybody does it and I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I can point out other people just as bad as I am, worse than I am. And so the devil wants you to excuse it like he did in the Garden of Eden. God knows you're not that bad. But we're blocked in heaven and we don't find the prosperity. We don't find the favor there. Because the Bible says if you honor God with your substance, he's talking about in terms of tithing, then you've, honored, then you've honored God. As you've done it here, you've done it there. And it unblocks us that way. So when authority is blocked in heaven, you don't see the breakthrough and results. You have to begin to look at it and say, is there anything, Holy Spirit, show me. Let your light shine. So bring to my heart and mind anything that I have not dealt with whether it's been generational or whether it's been with me now. So Jesus brings up this, this, one of these other issues in Matthew, the 13th chapter, looking at verse 53. And this, this is really amazes me in this portion of scripture. Jesus had been ministering in miracles 
throughout Judea, primarily Capernaum, and uh, they were the message had gotten out, word of mouth's gotten out. Uh, he is uh, the one who's doing these miracles has now come to Nazareth. Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. And he came to pass, verse 53, when Jesus had finished these parables that he was been teaching outside of Nazareth, he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said. They were amazed at what he was saying, but they could not connect who it was saying these tremendous things. And because they couldn't get past who was saying it, they couldn't receive what they were saying. Does that make sense? In other words, sometimes we, get, we can't get past the person who is saying something and we, our ears just shut off to what's being said. Now look at this. They said to him, when he taught them in their synagogue, they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Question. That's exactly what causes authority to be blocked when we start questioning God why God them? Why God now? Why God have you not? Why, 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 why? The why question pushes the pause button on our life. And we spent 20 years asking God why. I've never found God really answer any why to me. He just says, keep going on. Same thing with Gideon. So, verse 55, this is what they were saying. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this his mother called Mary? She's very human. She's very natural. We, he looks just like us. And his brothers, James and uh, Joseph and Simon and Judas, they're all here. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? If he's like one of us, then he should be just as dumb and stupid as we are. It's not fair that he's operating outside of the family traditions and how he's operating, and it bothered them tremendously. Now notice the next part of this. So they were offended at him. They were offended not at God. They were offended at Jesus. How dare you get something from heaven that we didn't get? They were offended to him, but Jesus said to him, a prophet is not without honor. The word their honor is translated also the word kavod or glory. A prophet is not without glory except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do any mighty works or miracles because of their unbelief. We find that in Mark the sixth chapter where Jesus it says that Jesus recorded he healed a few sick folks. So he made a distinction between miracles and healings. That there was something about miracles that took a whole nother level of environment, a whole nother level of authority than, than what the, the healings were needed. And when Jesus came into that, that environment, he began to see questions instead of saying, we're thankful you're here, Jesus, and our life is going to be better now and bring out all the sick folks because he had done it everywhere else. What they did, they were offended. Now listen to me. The word offend, most of you know this, that is the word scandalon. Scandalon was a little trip stick that was on, the, on a trap. There always had to be something to spring the trap. And the little spring or the trip or the stick, you know, the little bunny runs under the box and hits the, the stick and the, the box falls down on the little bunny. You've seen that. That little trip stick was called the, the scandalon. The word scandal, we get the word scandal from, means offended. The devil wants to do things to cause an individual to be offended because when we're offended, we cannot see what God's doing and we can't hear one that God sends. <laughs> and because of that, instead of saying, here is the son of God, the one who'd worked miracles among us, we just couldn't get past the package and we couldn't hear what the message was. So much of the church world today is we're trying to package everything. We're a nice choir, a nice sounding this, a nice sounding that. I believe in excellence. But we, we delete the part where it says, and Jesus came in power, and he came in you for you to demonstrate power. Right. Now it's more like I want you just to kind of be here and hang out, and we won't do anything to embarrass you, won't do anything to challenge you, and we'll just look, sing kumbaya, and, and we'll just all be happy. So it becomes more of an institution than the church, the ecclesia. The word ecclesia actually means the called out of governing. The government of God called out. That's what ecclesia, which is the word for church. Church was to be those called out of darkness to govern as heaven is in earth. Yes. Takes on a whole nother level of church, doesn't it? 
thought church was a place we came for potlucks and could see and see, be seeing people. Well, my friends go to that church, so therefore I need to be in that church, and so that's where I'm at. Instead of saying, I'm called out to be a governing force in the earth for the kingdom of God. So when they heard, that, heard these things, though they, there was need there, they were offended at the person and they couldn't get past him. <laughs> I remember this was many years ago, a little church we were starting up before this, and um, then saw and seen a lady there very long, and so I called her up and, and I said, hey, how, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. And she said, well, pastor, you know, I love you and, and um, miss you. And I said, yeah, well, what's the problem? Well, there's another lady in the church, and she said to me a few weeks ago, is this the second time you've wore that dress this month? I just cannot ever come back. I love the teaching. I love what God's doing there, but I can't come back. Now, was this lady offended or not? You know what? She went back to a denominational church that had, was not teaching really much truth at all, and she says, it's a terrible place, but I don't have anybody bothering me there. She, she gave up hearing and experiencing the presence of God because she was offended and the offended caused her to be suspended. She was on hold. She was stopped because of the scandal on and the devil came along to create a, stand, a scandal so she would miss the miracles that God had in store for her. You know, I've always looked at this verse of scripture and saying, that's, that's pretty, pretty powerful when Jesus said, I could not do any mighty works there. But part, some of the scholars believe the idea, and I, I tend to go this way, is that because Jesus was all-powerful, all-understanding, he chose not to do miracles in front of the devil there in the mountain, and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, though he could have commanded those stones to become bread. He didn't use his authority to satisfy himself. Jesus could have used authority and said, let me just prove to you scoundrels, you ungrateful, hot and tot, fine of folks you are, let me show you that the devil of you are. I just call fire down right now and just heal everybody. How's that? And just how you like that? I'll show you. I mean, that's kind of how I think about it. I'd, I'd want to do that. And that's why that evidently God has not trusted me with fire yet. <laughs> I've told you that I've really asked the Lord that one day that I would call fire down out of heaven. And he says, you don't know what spirit you are. And I see, I'm pretty good spirited right now. <laughs> but if I gave you that, I don't take it back you've got to walk in it, not just having a good day. <laughs> well, I'm good today, God. Well, I know today. I'm not concerned about it today. It's tomorrow when you hit the traffic <laughs> that I'm concerned about. Because <laughs> God knows that I could straighten out that traffic issue on the loop right quick. If you burned out cars, we wouldn't have this problem. People running lights the way they would do that. If they feared God, they wouldn't run those lights. Although I ran one the other day, not meaning to. And so I'm like, mercy for me, fire for everybody else. <laughs> so God has not yet trusted me with fire. I'm getting there. I'm a work in progress, but I haven't quite got there. Because they were offended, the authority that they could have had was stopped right then. I find when people are easily offended, right when they start making moves towards God, the devil steps up and he said, if I have somebody in store for you, somebody's right when you think that you're about to take all this, somebody will come up and say to you, yeah, I heard that preached 20 years ago. That's nothing new. And with my gracious heart, I say, well, if you got it 20 years ago, I wouldn't be having to say it now. I'm a work in progress. What can I say? <laughs> the anointing comes sometimes, and then I, you know. Jesus said, "A prophet cannot is not carrying this carries glory. There's a weightiness of God Himself kavod on him, except among people who diminish him and say to him, you are just like us. You have not the right because you're one of us to speak into our lives that way.'" Isn't it interesting that the people that live in your own house, they don't want to take advice from you? I had this conversation with my daughter not too long ago. I was, she was asking for some advice, or she just wasn't asking. She was stating, I got a problem. I said, here's what you do, blah, 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 blah. And she said, oh, Dad. 
And I said, you know, those people pay for that advice and you're getting it free. <laughs> she came back and I told her, I said, listen, I'm never going to tell you anything from this day on unless you ask for it. She came back and apologized. And now that she does, says, I want to know what you think about this. And I said, okay, pay me and I'll give it to you. <laughs> Because when you get something for nothing, that's exactly the value that you place on it. So, <laughs> And because if they didn't see Jesus as the prophet, the one that was sent to them, they could not receive what the prophet had. Isn't that what scripture says? If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you have the prophet's reward. What is the prophet's reward? Is the gifting that it carries. Because you said that you were just like one of us. Then he went away, healed a few sick folks, maybe because out of compassion where they were, and nothing else happened to that. Now, here's the interesting part of this towards the end of this. It says that Jesus, this is Mark 6 primarily, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. He called their attitude was unbelief. It wasn't that they didn't believe that it wasn't happening in Capernaum. They saw it happening. But their unbelief was about how they heard him. Now listen to me. Unbelief is not the idea that you don't think it's possible, but unbelief can be the idea is I just don't like the way that God did it. There's times people get disappointed with God because he didn't do it like they had predetermined he should do it, and the Bible calls it unbelief. Belief is not just the possibility thinking, but it's disconnecting from the way God wants to do it. And so an, an unbeliever is one as I didn't want God to do it that way. When I was praying for a good seat in the plane, I didn't have any, you know, I thought I hope, I'm happy for anything. God is blessing anything, so it happened. But if I had it already predetermined in my mind, thought out, I'm going to go up there, I'm going to go to the agent desk in there, and, and they're going to say, Mr. Kirkwood, we've been waiting for you. And we have a seat for you in first class, and we've been push, pushing everybody out of the side, and we want you to board first because you are so wonderful. We have in our mind how we want God to do something so that it will be grandiose. And God, if I were you, I would do it like this. And so everybody would recognize I'm your favorite one. Or... You cannot get mad at God when he doesn't do it that way because you're, in all things, I'm going to be thankful. And the word thankful is the word Eucharist, which, means, which is the word body of Christ. In all things, I'm going to be the body of Christ, operate under the body of Christ, act like the body of Christ, and, and see the body of Christ served more than myself. When that is understood, then God has a way of giving us things that he wants to, not how we think it ought to be done. Though there were things in store that the Father had in store for them, but because they could not receive it from the package who was coming, they were offended. Well, I just don't like those charismatics. If God wants to heal me, then he knows where I'm at. And if God wants to heal me, then this, will ha this, this, and this, and this will have to happen, and this, this, and this will have to happen, and all these things will happen, then I'm ready to be healed. It's a privilege for God to heal you. Because we see it in that way, we get suspended because of being scandalized. I remember a girl one time came to me and said, uh, said, pray with me, I have a car. And I said, what happened to the car that you had? I knew you had a car. Well, I gave it away. Well, did God tell you to give it away? And she said, well, I was listening to Kenneth Copeland. He gave his plane away and got a bigger plane. I gave my car away, and I said, how long has it been? Six months. I said, then do you have a bigger car? She said, I have no car. And she was really mad at God. And I said, did God tell you specifically that you were to do this and told you who to give it to, how to, and all that? She said, no. And I said, then you ought to walk. <laughs> to say God said when God didn't say means you've taken God's name in vain, and now you're mad at God? Because he didn't provide what you wanted him to provide. He's the celestial butler in your mind. And she started negotiating. God, if you want me to serve you, then here's the deal. I said, you realize that you don't bargain to the one who created you. Can the, say, the clay say to the potter, why have you made me thus? It doesn't work that way. You don't know God. If you knew God, you'd be in fear of God instead of mad at him. You'd say, God, I'm just thankful to be breathing today. 
I'm thankful that I have a roof over my head, which I did in the middle of the night when I heard those rains and sound. Thank you, God, we're dry. And so when we come to the point of recognizing that God may have not done it and acted and reacted the way we wanted to, two things, my authority is either blocked in heaven or the, other, the idea God has something in store. I'm not ready for fire yet, but I will one day. It's getting me there. Here's an interesting understanding of this, that Jesus came with his heart ready to do it, but he couldn't do it there. I've been around ministries another time when they blamed themselves and was upset with themselves and upset with God when, the, when they weren't able to have the place, the pouring out like they wanted to. Let me tell you, when we're serving God, it is a matter of saying, I am cooperating with him. And in Mark 6, it said that because of their unbelief, Jesus could only heal a few sick folks. Jesus called it unbelief when his disciples, those he had discipled, he calls us, why are you so full of unbelief? He started talking about bread, and he said, oh, he's mad. They're out in the boat, and they're mad because we didn't bring any bread. He was talking about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He wasn't talking about hungry, that their minds are always upon their needs and their personal issues instead of he's saying, get it off of there. I'm talking about you eternal matters, and you're thinking about temporal matters. They were worried about Caesar, and Jesus wanted to talk him to the government of heaven. What about Caesar? Are you going to come in and kick out Rome? We don't want to give this thing to Caesar. I mean, they hated the Romans. And Jesus said, give me a coin. Looked at whose head's on there, whose picture on there. Well, that's Caesar. Then give this to Caesar, but then give to God what belongs to God. Well, what belongs to God? You. And everything, the substance that, you, that God gives you through you. Otherwise, you take ownership. Here's an interesting verse of scripture in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. And it's, and it's an understanding how authority can be blocked and how sometimes the reasons that we can, that authority is blocked. In 2 Kings 5, and you pick it up in verse, in verse 8, there's a story concerning Naaman. Naaman was a Syrian commander. He had great authority, and he was recognized in his circles that he was one who people just feared and bowed down to. Let's pick it up in, in uh, verse 9. Naaman, this Syrian soldier, when his, went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house because, let me give you the backstory of this. Yeah, there was an Israeli young girl that was taken prisoner. She was now a slave, and she was t speaking to Naaman's wife and saying, because uh, Naaman had leprosy, which was a type of, of just uh, God's rejection of sin and so on. It was, it was the killer of the day. It was like the AIDS of the day. And people couldn't even get close to a leper. They were the outcasts. They were completely had to be a, move, removed from society. And the maid said to his wife, said, I wish that, that Naaman your husband, could go to the prophet in Israel because there's one there that could heal him. So he goes to the Syrian king and he says, I hear there's a prophet in Israel. And so the king gives him letters to give to the Israeli king and tell them that I'm coming here to be healed. If you go back in the first verses of that, and when the, the, the king of Syrian, Syria brings his, the papers through Naaman to the Israeli king. The Israeli king panics and said, they're setting us up because if we can't heal this guy, and who am I, God, that I can heal? And I can't heal him, then they're gonna have an excuse for them to come over and, and fight us because we couldn't heal their guy. Finally, so that's not the issue. Find the prophet. He comes down to, to Elisha's house and he's standing outside, verse nine. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, all this, this fanfare. He stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. All right, man, you got a prophet. You got a prophetic word. God said, but, you know what but means? Just what I said, just disconnect and disannul it. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, you ought to underline that. I said to myself, I said to myself is code for an inner vow. I said to myself is code for it is 
pride. I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. He had predetermined that this is how he would be healed. He's going to come out to me, stand and call on the name of the Lord God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy, you know, and hocus pocus and all this stuff. And he should have done that. But he told, tells me to go wash in Jordan. How dare him? Because everybody knew Jordan was pretty muddy at that time. He said, aren't there not uh, the Abana and the Far Far, that's good rivers, and the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Here's, here's what I see many times for even believers. We have predetermined our mind how God would do it. And when God doesn't do it the way he went to do it, we are suspended. I'm offended at God. I've had people tell me that I have financial need. And some, some guy on TV said, there's checks in the mail. They go out to the mailbox every day and look in the mailbox. And there's no check in there. After a week or two of that, they become angry at God. I was talking to a person. He was telling me about this. I said, have you ever tithed? You give the Lord? No, why would I do it? God don't need my money. I said, he doesn't need it, but he commands us to. That it's a power to make wealth. And if you honor the Lord with your substance, then he will make the windows of heaven open to you. You're asking for the windows to be open without you doing your part in obedience. So why are you becoming angry at God? He is held to his word. God is God. It's not that he's mad at you. You're mad at him because he hasn't opened the windows of heaven. You haven't put any seed in the ground and you go out every day looking, how come there's no carrots there? God hadn't provided for me. Well, that's the way this thing walks down. So Naaman, who's used to having everything his way and having authority, his authority is now blocked and he can't proceed out of that and he's stuck with leprosy. A miracle is needed and he's the killer of the day. Also, his ministry, his authority is now suspended because you can't lead an army when nobody wants to be around you. Because what you have is so contagious, you can't be around. So though you have a position of authority, you're blocked and you can't operate in authority because of this issue, the leprosy. And many of that day said that God was, you know, cursed them or something like that. It was a curse. And when the prophet gave him a word, it says, go dip in Israel seven times. He was upset because he didn't get personal attention by the prophet. Don't you know who you're talking to, boy? I am here. People, people respect me. Instead of being like the centurion that, came, that Jesus came to, and he said, I have my servant sick. Jesus said, I'll go heal him. He said, no, no, no. I am man under authority. I understand authority. When one says go, go, he does. And one says come, he comes. All you have to do is speak the authority. The humility of the centurion released, and Jesus says go, he's healed. But Naaman, one is authority, commander, he is so angered because there wasn't a band to greet him and the prophet didn't even come out of his house. Have you ever been offended because God didn't meet your need the way you thought he ought to meet it? Years ago, I remember Diane and I have a friend and, she, and there was a move of God going on here in the 90s and called Renewal. And uh, she didn't attend church here. And so, but she says, will you pray that God will send the river, that's what we call it in those days, send the river to me where I'm at. And I, I didn't know how to answer that. I said, it's not up to me. I said, I just flow with the river. I'm not, I don't direct the river. I'm not Paul Bunyan's going to dig a whole another hole through there and get you a river over there. She said, pray that it'll come to my church. And so I didn't say anything to her because I didn't know how to really answer that. So a week or two went by. She called us and she said, God spoke to me about the river. And he said to me, if you want the river, you go to where the river is. Don't wait for the river to come to you. She was really offended because God wasn't doing that where he, she was. And he should because who she is. She'd been faithful. And so she didn't really find herself. She had to find herself now submitting herself and giving herself to, to what God had said. And not even saying, well, there's better rivers. I know we could do it this way. If God would do this, I think we'd do this really neat way. And sometimes in church life, we'd say, well, I want God to move, but I don't want him to move messy. 
I want it to be a neat little package where the fire of God comes down. Ooh, that feels good. Kind of warms you up a little bit. <laughs> Not too much. Just like you went through the McDonald's or Burger King, I think it is. Have it your way. And you can order it. Order revival the way you want it. I have a friend saying that uh, their church was pretty uh, outgoing. They dance a lot and just worship and get a little now noisy. And, and um, one day the mayor came to the church, city of the mayor, mayor of the city came to the church. And he said, oh God, I know today. I pray today, God, if you will just keep everybody settled down and particularly named a couple of people that they'll get noisy, especially when we sing about the blood and all of that kind of, that you would just keep it down and let's be respectable. He thought, I thought God answered the prayer. I felt okay about it. Kept looking on my shoulder. The mayor's here, the mayor's here, small town. And he said, that day, the worship leader sang about the power of blood. And I knew as soon as they did that, two or three people would break out and they started running around the church, running, 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 running. And the louder they would sing it, the faster they'd run and they'd run. I thought, oh God, okay, that's enough. We're happy with that. Hallelujah, praise God. And they just wouldn't stop and wouldn't stop and all that. And I said, oh man. <laughs> Had to be on this day, didn't it, God? I ask you for a normal day. God, what's normal to God's difference normal to us. The mayor came up to him afterwards. He said, oh, I'm just, I'll just apologize to him. Never apologize for God. He came and says, uh, your honor, I'm so, we're so glad that you're here today. But let me just tell you about today. It's not always. And he said, hold it. I need to tell you about what happened. I, I've gone to a bunch of the churches in the area. And I can tell you they're pretty much all the same. I go away feeling like I've just eaten styrofoam. There was something different about today. When those people started running like that, my heart leapt up inside of me, and I thought, surely there's a God in this city. And he said, yeah, that's what we do, man. That's where we are. That's where I praise God. Hallelujah. Sometimes we start trying to direct the way that we think that people want it. Just order it your way and say God is the God of the universe and the way you want. Jesus died for the church. We didn't. He started the church the way he wanted it. Now he wants the church the way he started it. He started it in power. He started it in the authority of the believer. He started it empowering people to do the work of the ministry, the purposes of God. Don't let the devil put you on the back seat, the back line, the not to you guys on the back seats. <laughs> I'm talking about putting you in the back some way, putting you out of line, putting you on the shelves, what I'm thing there, and, and just cause, well, I've just, you know, been over it, over it. I'm just over it. It's coming back on the airplane. Man, I was, I was tired, exhausted. Very little voice laid down the Lord's, and I was just thanking the Lord for the meeting, and the devil said, you're getting too old for this. <laughs> well, I knew it wasn't God, because I, I, he just told me, you know, he had things he had in store, and you're getting too old for this. You need to let a younger generation do it. And I said, I'd be happy for the younger generation to do it. They can come alongside of me, but I'm going to be there. The Bible says, I'm talking about name and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. If you have been one that have been angry at God and been saying, God, you should have, you could have, and you got all this stuff, then you come before God and say, I'm sorry that I've been the accuser to you and you have things in store because trust is when you don't know what's happened going to happen but you know who your trust is it'll be good and you don't know when it'll happen but you're trusting confident lean not to your own understanding which is how I want it to happen and I have people in their mind how they think it ought to be and when it doesn't happen lean not to your own understanding trust in the Lord and he'll guide you in all your paths stand with me please Father, we believe that uh, you are...